Spread the fire. Welcome to another conversation here on SMWX. I am Lukona Mguni. Of course, coming to you again to share some political thoughts. And we are in the midst of the silly season, what we call, you know, political parties going on a marketing frenzy of selling ideas, promises, some lies, hopes, and dreams. It's a really, really fascinating period. There's a lot of energy uh, put into these elections, a number of new players uh, that uh, probably a year ago we had no idea uh, who they are, where they are from, and what it is that they are doing. So many political parties have been launched in the last year, and a number of existing and established political parties uh, have also found new energy. I mean, who would have thought that the Congress of the People, COPE, would be worried about a stampede at their manifesto launch to a point that they would actually postpone it? Some people are saying, are there even five people to attend a COPE manifesto? Okay, I'm, just, I'm joking, I'm joking. I mean, this is a party that was actually new 15 years ago. And you know what? A lot of South Africans took a chance with the Congress of the People. Over 1 million people voted for COPE in 2009, and that meant the party could send no less than 30 members of parliament to the National Assembly. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about what I call an interesting interpretation of new parties and small parties in an election. Recently, in the last 5 to 10 years, the Democratic Alliance has been talking a lot about small parties, cautioning South Africans not to vote for small parties. I find these uh, remarks extremely anti-democratic because today's small party could be tomorrow's big party. Let's go back to 1994. What was a small party in 1994? The Democratic Party was a small party. It gained 1.73% of the vote and allowed them to send seven members of parliament to the National Assembly. The Democratic Party is today's Democratic Alliance. They now have managed in one election to get four million votes, and that stood them well at about 22%. In 2019, they lost a bit, and they were at 20%. What does that mean? in terms of the 400 seats available in the National Assembly, they are able to send over 70 members of parliament. That is 10 times. If actually there is an interesting story of political growth since 1994, it's the DA story. But the lesson to take from that is one should not be fearful to try out a new party or a small party with their vote. Because if you are deploying it to a party that is actually serious about growth, about South African politics, about the electorate, and can demonstrate track record over time in between elections, that party could actually grow. And guess what you would be able to say? I was one of the people that took a chance with a small party or a new party, and it has managed to grow. Another new party that has managed to grow, actually, over the years is the EFF. They were celebrating 10 years of existence last year, and they did the whole shebang at the FNB Stadium, where we saw the leader of the EFF rise above uh, the supporters and members and leaders of the EFF uh, during the end of his speech. It was a spectacle. It got a lot of tongues talking. But the story that I want to tell is the opportunity at times that is given to voters by new parties and small parties. So I always run into a bit of a tussle with DA leaders when they go on about this idea that you need to vote for the DA because the small parties are trying to, you know, eat away from the possibility of removing the ANC. Come on. The small parties and new parties exist to offer the electorate choices. Choices that may not be what the DA offers. 
choices that may not be what the DA stands for. <clears throat> this idea that there has to be what some people call a binary political landscape, where there is one party this side and another this side, and you only have two major political parties. It sounds desirable. It almost sounds like it is easier to manage the political landscape when you only have two or three dominant political parties. The truth, though, is it distorts the vibrancy of a democracy. It erodes the possibility of a diverse number of views influencing the body politic. I mean, we don't have to look far. We just need to look at the United States. The Republicans and the Democrats, very dominant political parties. Hardly ever will you find a president who does not come from these two parties in the U.S. But guess what? Besides the colors that one is red and the other is blue, there are times when you cannot tell the difference between these two political parties because they breathe and live for establishment politics that, you know, perpetuate inequality in the United States, that prioritize the elites and leave many people in the U.S. behind. And that's why a number of people live in distress. They have to have more than one job in order to have a chance at a living wage. And they have to do a lot more other things for survival. Not the America that we see in the movies. In the real day-to-day -day life of Americans, there continues to be a lot of vulnerability. But they also served a lot of establishment propaganda about the American dream and how to see the world and how to be in the world. So those are two dominant parties. It may look like it's easier to manage that political system, but it may deprive voters of a vibrant democracy that is influenced by a number of ideas. Now, our constitution, adopted in 1996, promotes the idea of a multi-party democracy. The importance of that is so that as many people in society as possible can find a voice in our democracy. Now, some small parties or new parties might not make it to parliament, but in the process of the election and the electioneering, as they chant their slogans, as they give us their manifestos, as they do the debates and the, you know, and the jeering with other political parties, they introduce us to new political ideas, which could be useful for some people who feel the current political parties do not represent them enough. As you know, over the years, South Africa has gone through many changes. We've moved from a smaller number of parties represented in parliament to a record number of 14 political parties currently represented in the National Assembly. What that does is to promote vibrancy and plurality of ideas. But it also means that people of various ideological orientations have a home and a voice inside parliament, which is meant to be the representative house of the people, not of politicians and political parties. The idea of a representative democracy is that those who serve in parliament serve at the behest of the population. Of course, our electoral system makes it at the behest of political parties, but that's neither here nor there for now. Story for another day. If you think of the parties that are in parliament, Al Jama, for example, has a completely different ideological orientation and understanding of who it serves. Those people have a voice in parliament. The African Transformation Movement, ATM, has its own commitment to servant leadership and, you know, a, a strong African ethos, Africanization ethos, and also still standing for South Africa. And they have a very different ideological orientation to other parties. The EFF is known for what it is standing for, what it champions, and has 
distinguished itself, for example, on one of the most contentious topics in the South African political landscape around borders and the protection of borders. Now, the EFF says, we need a borderless Africa. Some people say, no, 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 no. We do not need a borderless Africa. We need to protect our borders to make sure that the influx of foreign nationals is not as much as it is because of the porous borders. But the EFF will tell you that it stands by its ethos of pan-Africanism. And therefore, that ethos means there ought to be a borderless Africa, and that's what the party strives for. But there are other ideological orientation uh, policies that come out of the EFF. The Democratic Alliance stands for a particular agenda, which is not so close to that of the Freedom Front Plus. The point I'm trying to make is, as a result of this commitment to a multi-party democracy, South Africa finds itself with a plurality of voices, not only in the political landscape, <clears throat> but inside the hallways of parliament. Now, what do the established political parties do in trying to manage the stage of politics? They even contemplate introducing something called electoral thresholds. Now, an electoral threshold means if you don't get X number of votes or a an X or a Y percentage of the votes, you would not be allowed to occupy a seat in parliament, even though ordinarily the number of votes you get would actually mean that you um, have a seat. <clears throat> let, me tell, let, let me illustrate the point. I just said there are 14 political parties in the National Assembly. Now, the DA, in agreement with the ANC, funny enough, sometimes they do agree. Maybe they agree more than they disagree. Story for another day. The DA proposes a private member's bill through its chief whip. This private member's bill introduces electoral thresholds. It says, a party to end a seat in parliament must at least get 1% of the votes in an election. Now, do you know what would that mean in the current National Assembly that is almost expiring on the 29th of May, 2024, when all of you beautiful South Africans will have a chance to go out and vote? And let's go out in numbers to vote and vote and vote and vote. So if you implemented a 1% threshold, you would minus nine political parties in the current National Assembly. There are only five political parties, five, that received more than 1% of the vote. The ANC, the DA, the EFF, the IFP, and the Freedom Front Plus. That means all the people whose voice resonates with the ACDP would not be represented. The ATM, the PAC, Al Jama, COPE, African uh, Independent Congress, AIC, NFP, UDM, ATM. I'm not sure who else I might be forgetting. But nine political parties, good. Who can forget good? And Pet would not be in cabinet because good did not receive 1% and therefore it would mean they can't occupy a seat. Would that be fair, South Africans? Well, it's for you to have that debate because I can tell you after these elections, that's one debate that's going to be hot and happening as the established political parties try to fix the political stage for their own preservation and their own sustenance, particularly as we move towards the possibility of coalition governments in very big provinces like KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, and possibly the Western Cape and nationally. So if you can manage the number of players, you make it possibly easier to actually cobble up coalition governments together. However, that is not the point. We should not be worried about how easy or not it is for political actors and political principles to get into deals. At the heart of it, we must sustain the plurality of choices that are open and available to South African voters and the people of South Africa. So you can already tell that there's value in having small parties in parliament. And if those small parties in parliament do their work well, 
there is potential for growth. And if they grow, it means that the constituencies and the people who resonate with those people, uh, with those parties, have a chance at having a bigger voice. You know, most in parliament, they give you speaking time according to how well you are represented. So if a small party keeps growing, its voice in parliament also grows, and therefore its ability to speak to South Africans and on behalf of South Africans also gets to grow. So the point I'm making, here is a Democratic Party in 1994 at 1.73%, a very tiny party with seven seats, but is able to grow to more than 70 seats in the democratic dispensation of South Africa. It therefore debunks the myth that voting for small parties erodes the achievement of the opportunity for change. In actual fact, it may well be that there are smaller parties with an ability that the Democratic Alliance does not have. What are some of those abilities? <laughs> Those who've been following the landscape of, of, of our politics or following our politics over the years uh, will know that there has always been this talk about a party reaching its ceiling. In the sense, with the Democratic Alliance, the ceiling would have been, it saturates its core base. The Democratic Party was a white party, um, historically. Um, the DA comes from a history of white parties. So it would saturate the white uh, voter base that it has available to it. It would forage into other bases. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, electoral uh, results and electoral dynamics analysis is very much race bound because there are um, in there is a great influence uh, that race has in terms of how people make their voting choices. And partly that's why we established the proportional representation system in 1994 so that parties who would be embedded particularly in what was called minority group constituencies could have an opportunity to actually make it to parliament and represent those minority constituencies so that we don't have a system that is dom overly dominated by one racial group and one racial profile in terms of representation in parliament. Anyway, another story for another day. But the point I'm making is that the DA would then forage into other constituencies, black voters, colored voters, Indian voters. But it would eventually saturate because of the nature of its politics. It is a liberal party after all. And therefore there are things it stands for that do not augur well with some constituencies. For example, the DA's approach to redress for past injustices of colonialism and apartheid is not as punchy and as robust, for example, as the ANC, the DA takes issue with, you know, uh, what it deems racial quotas uh, in the sense of affirmative action, uh, you know, broad-based black economic empowerment, and so on. There may well be mistakes committed and injustices committed in the employment of or deployment of these policies, but it cannot take away the necessity of greatly thought out policies to redress the injustices of the past. It's very important that there are policy instruments that are deliberately designed to uplift the majority of people who were oppressed, who were uh, structurally violated and physically violated, uh, whose opportunities were were left to a small set of, uh, you know, jobs and uh, business opportunities that were, you know, uh, to limit their growth and their development. And this is why a lot of people, when they think of, uh, you know, apartheid, we go back uh, to Fervut, uh, the so-called founding father of apartheid, in terms of what was the grand vision of apartheid, to make black people hewers of wood and drawers of water. So you immediately structurally imagined a majority of the population as not good enough beyond being hewers of wood and drawers of water. Basically, servants of other people. Then the apartheid government would come with things, um, of course, the oppressive governments generally uh, would come with job reservations. Uh, black people could only occupy these jobs. Uh, 
would come with the group areas act in terms of where you can go where you can't go where you should live where you can't live and uh, removed did mass removals of people from their homes to these newly reserved areas according to race and racial lines um there were other things in terms of accessing school in terms of accessing university i mean black people had to write a letter to the minister of education to justify why, even though they were human beings, competent academically and otherwise, to justify why they should go to a particular university to study medicine or to study this and not some of these menial jobs or, for, or these careers that were reserved for black people. There are many other things in terms of how the population registry was managed. I mean, black people couldn't use the same entrance as white people, couldn't use the same beaches as white people, couldn't use the same modes of transport as white people. And the story goes on. I mean, our grandparents, my grandfather tells me excruciating stories of his own experiences during apartheid when he traveled from the Eastern Cape to the then Natal, from, from the then Transkei to the then Natal. And they would be taken to an area almost known as a dip, which is where the Guamotle Museum resides today in Durban. And there they would have a doctor strip them naked, you know, search them if they are not coming and bringing in diseases and all of these things and so on. So anyway. I'm trying to paint a picture of the brutality of oppression from a structural point of view. Leave the arrests, the police brutality, people dying in police cells, people dying in exile, people being bombed through cross-border raids of the apartheid regime in Lesotho and in other countries and so on. Leave that. The structural nature of it, the legislative oppression that was there during apartheid and colonialism. You cannot convince anybody that to undo and unburden the country from that centuries-long oppression of the majority of people, you do not need legislative instruments. So I'm trying to say there are things that the DA says or does that do not appeal to certain constituencies of people. And those people are hungry, some of them, for political change. Some of those people thought that political change would come through the instrument of the liberation movement, that is the African National Congress. Unfortunately, they have been disappointed by the ANC's lack of commitment to its own policy agenda. That's why you hear so many leaders of the ANC keeping on saying, the ANC has good policies, but the leaders are bad. Some of the leaders are corrupt. Some of the leaders are incompetent. Some of the leaders don't care. Some of the leaders mismanage the portfolios they are given. The point, what options should be available to those kind of people? They used to vote for the ANC. They are disaffected with the ANC. They are disillusioned with the ANC. In fact, some of them have stopped voting for the ANC. And instead of voting for someone else, they choose not to vote. And they say, there are no clear options in the political landscape. Though I think that is a cop-out to this election. There are so many options to a point of fatigue, I'm telling you. Uh, you just need to look around, shop around. I mean, do your window shopping politically, and you will probably land at a good place. There are definitely options. This idea that there are no options, I think it's a nice excuse not to make a decision. Uh, making decisions is not always easy, folks. It's sometimes hard, but decisions have to be made. The point I'm making... When an established political party like the Democratic Alliance, which has benefited from growth as a small party to a mid-sized party, begins to say, don't vote for small parties, do you know what that behavior is like? I'll tell you what that behavior is like. It's like those fellows who climb the ladder, you know, in the workplace. And once they get inside, and we've all been fighting to get inside, you know, we're all fighting to get inside, we're fighting to get inside, we're talking the same language, transformation agenda, this and that and that. And then you have now transformed and you are inside. What do you do? You kick the ladder down because you want to remain alone inside. That's what the Democratic Alliance is doing. And it should not be allowed to propagate that narrative because that narrative has a, a potential to injure the vibrancy of our democracy. That's why even this idea of electoral thresholds should not be entertained because it will mean our choices as voters are undermined by some silly percentage that has been set by politicians because they want to shut out more competition out of the political landscape. But anyway, I said that fight is coming after the elections. For now, 
this discussion is about. How do we make choices going into this upcoming election on the 29 May 2024? When South Africa is at 30, I think there is an opportunity to look around and marvel the fact that 30 years after our democratic dispensation, we are still able to have so many political parties and none of these political leaders of opposition are being jailed, are being killed, are being maimed at scale. No, 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 no. There may well be shenanigans, you know, and forms of coercion that the ANC has, just like I'm saying the DA has, by talking down and speaking down small and new political parties. But we still have a very active democracy that is allowing multipartism. We still have broadcasting platforms like SMWX that have debates with different political parties, and nobody shuts this place down. So there has to be something celebrated at South Africa, as South Africa turns 30 this year about the vibrancy of our democracy, about some opening of media spaces. Sure, some media houses may decide they don't like that party or they don't like the leader of that party, therefore they'll give very little airtime. But I mean, in my, on my TV screens in the last week or so, I've seen so many different political parties. Either they are picketing, others are launching, you know, premier campaigns, others are launching manifesto campaigns, others are, you know, doing community work and community service, trying to win the hearts and minds of South Africans. And that space remains open. And we must jealously safeguard that space as South Africans, if we want this democracy to give us a chance, a possible chance at the full representation of as many people, as many views, and as many sectors in our parliament. Because our parliament is the place where the voices of South Africans should vibrantly contend for policy formulation and legislation development, where we hold the executive to account for the things that they have promised through whether the State of the Nation address, the budget speeches that get delivered and tabled to parliament, and the laws that get adopted for the betterment of this country. But more significantly, for the realization of the Bill of Rights that sits as Chapter 2 in our Constitution. So this election, I want to say there are no small parties. There are parties that are trying to convince all of us to give them a chance, a vote, and a shot at making it to parliament or the provincial legislatures. There are also independent candidates. Imagine if the narrative is that don't vote for small parties. It's clear don't vote for independent candidates because guess what? An independent candidate can only occupy one seat in a legislature. But we can't say that. The Constitution allows us to vote for whomever we so wish to vote. And our vote this time around must also communicate that we, the people of South Africa, have a sense of where we want this country to go the kind of change we want to see in our political system and the kind of leaders we want to give a chance in terms of representing us. And like I said just earlier, I think there's more than enough choices on the ballot this time around. I can just name probably 40, 50 different political parties at a go. And there's something to see and feel in all of them and then make a choice of what resonates with you. Or... Make a choice of who you don't want to see getting out of parliament. Or make a choice about who you definitely want of the new players to see making it to parliament. But what is clear for me is that today's small party can be tomorrow's big party and even tomorrow's governing party. So we must not be scared to make a choice, take a chance, bet. Because guess what? If you take a chance on the wrong horse this year, there is an opportunity five years down the line to change that choice. But as I started off in 2009, when it was not fashionable for people to even think of voting against the ANC, when it was not fashionable for people to leave the ANC because they were always told, the grass is not so green on the other side. How things have changed in a 15-year period. I go around the country 
And there are people who are saying they can't wait to vote against the ANC. And to an extent, the ANC has still left that uh, you know, room open for them to make different choices in terms of who to vote for. And I think we should be able to sometimes say, kudos South Africa, kudos South Africans, and to a great degree, kudos to the ANC, because it has behaved in a different way than a number of liberation movements across the world who have shut down space for democratization, shut down space for a vibrant opposition, shut down space for a vibrant media, shut down space for an independent judiciary, shut down space for opportunity for choices for the voters. And I think this election, the voters should be motivated that 30 years, 30 years after our democracy, we still have a viable opportunity to make choice and meaningful choices that our vote actually does count. Our vote is not going to go down some river, some bin on some fire and go missing and it's guaranteed who's going to win. It's not guaranteed who's going to win. Even the ANC accepts that and that's why they are doing what they do best, you know, taking out their election machinery in all its forms and sizes across the length and breadth of the country to still try win your hearts and minds as voters. And we've got to exercise this opportunity available to us wisely and not listen to those who try to tell us about small parties simply because they want to make themselves their only, the only choice available. If the DA feels strong about its offer, it must keep talking about its offer and South Africans must vote for it on the basis of its offer. But it must not close the democratic space and do what we might sometimes call voter suppression. Voter suppression is when you try and confuse voters or try alienate voters from making a choice simply because you've driven a message so much that it discourages them to vote. Do not be discouraged to go out on the 29th of May and vote for your small party. Vote for your new party. Vote for your choice that you believe is in the best service and interest of your aspirations for the South Africa that you want to belong to and the South Africa that you want for yourself, for future generations and generations to come. Aye, yeah.